Okay, so what I want you to do today is make sure that you're taking notes on the KWL chart. So anything that we talk about that you already know, put over here in the no column. Kind of makes sense, right? Uh, anything you wonder or have any questions about as we move through here, um, you can put in the uh, wonder column in the middle. And then anything you learn on the far right in the learn column. Pretty self-explanatory, right? No wonder learn KWL. So what we're looking at today, our essential question is what happened in Europe between World War I and World War II? And the answer is a whole lot. So just kind of buckle up because we're going to be covering up a lot. We're going to be covering a lot of stuff here in a short period of time. So uh, these are just some vocabulary terms. Uh, you, it, it's available to you on your Google Classroom if you need to go back and look at them. We're going to talk about some of these as we move through here. Um, so yeah, we're not going to sit down and actually come up with a definition for these right now. They're just some terms for you to look at uh, if you need to go back and look. Um, we'll start in post-war Italy because this is where things really kind of kick off in terms of uh, countries being taken, taken over by dictatorships. Uh, Italy is the first country to fall to a dictatorship uh, by 1925. So, similar to what we see in all these other countries, uh, Italians were very unhappy with the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, which is kind of funny because Italy had actually served on the side of the Allies in World War One, right? Like they fought, uh, they came into the war and fought with the British and French and Americans against the Germans and Austro-Hungarians. But they thought they were going to get better terms at the end of the war than they got. They thought they were going to get more territory. Um, they thought they were going to get overseas colonies. And ultimately, they kind of get the shaft. They don't get any of that. Um, Benito Mussolini, who is pictured here in the middle, uh, had been a leftist journalist before the war. He was actually a socialist before World War I. Uh, somehow avoided, I, I can't remember, I think he avoided serving in World War I somehow. I can't remember exactly how that happened. But um, After the war, he becomes overcome with nationalist fervor um, and basically believing in the, the glory of, of ancient Rome and reestablishing the glory of ancient Rome, which, of course, you know, at this point has been, what, 1,500 years ago? I mean, it's not like he... Uh, had any ancestors alive who even knew what the glory of ancient Rome was. Uh, but anyway, a lot of Italians really kind of became or, or fell in love with the idea of reestablishing the old Roman Empire. Um, and they believed that it was their duty to restore the former Roman Empire. So uh, Mussolini helped form the fascist party, the first of its kind, really. Um, when we think about fascism, this is where it really starts. The fascist party forms uh, here in Italy uh, under the direction of Benito Mussolini. Um, and, and the development of the black shirts, which is the black shirts refers to like a paramilitary group. So they're not really military. It's kind of like, you know, people talk about militias today a lot. It's sort of like having your own militia that just works for your party. Uh, that's what the black shirts were. Uh, and they helped, they helped secure Mussolini electoral victories. When we say, when we say they helped secure electoral victories, that means they, they basically beat up opponents um, with clubs, sometimes killed them. Uh, but generally, it was hard to run an election against them uh, because it was probably not very, uh, probably not very safe, not, probably not very helpful, healthy for you to, to partake in uh, running an election against them. Uh, they actually orchestrated a march on Rome in 1922. Um, the black shirts actually overthrew, basically sort of overthrew the government. Um, and they eventually set up Mussolini as the absolute dictator in 1925. The interesting thing about Italy is during this time, they also have a king who, is, who remains in power the entire time that Mussolini is dictator. I don't really understand how that works. Um, but basically the king, I guess, didn't, didn't really have a lot of power until he does have power at the end, whenever they're actually going to force Mussolini to advocate in 1944. So exactly what the king was doing up between 1925 and 1944 um, is uh, something I don't know enough about. So, are Mussolini's grandkids in the Italian government now? I don't know. That could be. I'm not sure. It would be kind of funny in some ways. Um, 
So anyway, Italy becomes an absolute or a dictatorship in 1925 under the direction of Benito Mussolini. And if I get to moving too fast at any point, just tell me to slow down. You don't have to. You don't have to write copy everything down word for word either. All right. Good. Okay. <laughs> Alessandro okay. Mussolini is an Italian politician and granddaughter of Benito Mussolini. Interesting. Um, what what party is she in in Italy? Let me see. It is kind of interesting. Uh, it hasn't even been that long ago that the grandchild, granddaughter of Benito Mussolini is still alive and actually in the Italian parliament today. Our party was Forza Italia. Mm -hmm. Is that the Italian Nationalist Party today? Forza Italia is a center right political party in Italy whose ideology includes elements of liberal conservatism. Christian democracy and liberalism. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So center right in Italy would probably be about center of the road here in the United States. Interesting. All right, so uh, the Treaty of Versailles and the Weimar Republic. So this is going to be Germany. So we're, we're going to kind of shift gears a couple of times. And I'm trying to stay as chronologically accurate as we can. So uh, the Treaty of Versailles forced Germany to become a constitutional monarchy, um, but really, it, mostly, it, it forced them to become basically a democracy, um, and it led to the creation of the Weimar Republic, um, which was the name that the German interim government has between 1919 and 1933. Um, Germany had many problems stemming from the end of World War I, and communists and royalists clashed in the streets. So in 1919-1920, there's a lot of fighting that's going on in Germany uh, on the streets, a lot of like running street battles between people who want to bring the king back and then also people who want to uh, basically experience a communist revolution like what Russia was going through at the time. So a lot of interesting elements fighting it out in the streets. Um, and also hyperinflation caused by reparation payments forced Germany into a severe depression. So remember we talked about the terms of the Treaty of Versailles being that Germany was going to have to pay back these huge reparation payments. They weren't able to pay it back. Um, it caused a devaluing in their credit. They weren't able to raise enough money um, to uh, pay those payments. And so it led to this super hyperinflation. Basically, money in Germany became essentially worthless, uh, and then you end up with, it looks like kids playing with building blocks there, but actually that's huge stacks of money. Um, that at one time had been worth a lot of money, but now it was completely worthless. Because uh, what you'll see a lot of, a lot of governments do whenever they uh, don't have enough money is they will print more money. The problem is, is that that just makes your money not worth anything internationally. Um, so, really bad times in Germany in the early 1920s. Do you need like a wheelbarrow full of cash to buy like a loaf of bread? Basically, yeah. Had to have about a wheelbarrow full of cash. Um, you got paid a wheelbarrow full of cash, um, you know, at, at lunchtime every day, and then you had to go and try to find somebody that would take, you know, your money to exchange it for something, and then you come back to work after your lunch break, and then you get paid again at the end of the day. You just do it all over again. Try to find some bread. Try to find some uh, firewood or something. So not great times uh, to be a German civilian. Um, so that brings us to Adolf Hitler, uh, the guy who we probably all already know at least a little something about at this point. Um, like in Italy, many Germans were furious over the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, probably even more so than the Italians, right? The Italians actually got winner's terms. Uh, the Germans got punished for a war that a lot of them felt like they didn't even necessarily lose. Um, Hitler originally joined the German Workers' Party, or the DAP, in 1919. 
It would change its name to the Nationalist Socialist German Workers Party in 1920, uh, or eventually what we would call today Nazis. Um, one thing about it is nationalists and socialists in the name is kind of like an oxymoron. Like, it's hard to be nationalist and socialist. It's pretty much impossible. Um, my college professor used to say that they were really big on the nationalist part and really not very big on the socialist part. Um, and they'll actually expel anybody that still maintains a socialist angle by uh, 1934, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, Hitler and the SA, which were stormtroopers, brown shirts, again, another paramilitary group, kind of like the black shirts in Italy, uh, tried to begin a revolution in Bavaria in an attempted coup known as the Beer Hall Putsch. Basically, there was this guy named Erich Lit Lit uh, Ludendorff who had been the, the commanding general of the German forces at the end of World War One. Hitler thought that he should be running the show. Um, and so they tried to hold a, a coup, not for Hitler to take power, but for Ludendorff to take power. And, they, and Ludendorff was kind of standoffish about it. Like, it was kind of like, well, you know, I don't really want to support you, but if you're successful, then yeah, I'll do it. But if not, then I don't want any part of it. Uh, anyway, Hitler ends up getting arrested. You know, generally, the uh, sentence for uh, committing treason is what? Yeah, yeah. Death. But for some reason, the, the judge decides to give Hitler uh, a year in prison. That's all he's going to serve. So he commits treason, gets caught. Instead of being put to death, he gets a year in prison. So this was the first time that somebody could have stopped Hitler, and they didn't. And there will be many other times that somebody could have stopped Hitler, and they don't. All these times. So um, while he's in prison, he decides to write a book on his experiences in World War I, and he calls it Mein Kampf, which means my struggle. Um, and you do need to remember that he wrote the book Mein Kampf. That's the name of the book that he wrote. Um, it was mostly about his experiences in World War I. He had actually been a decorated uh, soldier in World War I. Um, and he also wrote about his books on, or his thoughts on Germany and the Weimar Republic. Um, in his book, Hitler blamed Jews and communists for stabbing Germany in the back and making them lose World War I. Basically, he said that all of Germany's troubles were because of these socialists and, and communists and um, and it just so happened, basically, they kind of made Jews and communists almost synonymous with each other. Um, and basically, all these people who were shirkers, who had never actually fought, who were behind the lines, who basically just didn't support the war effort enough that they had caused the Germans to lose. Uh, and he found a really receptive audience with a lot of, of German um, veterans who had fought in World War I, uh, who were also looking for someone to blame. And it just seemed like a pretty easy scapegoat. Uh, to blame Jews and communists. Uh, he also laid out his plans to conquer much of Europe in order to give the German people elbow room known as Lebensraum. Or Lebensraum. Um, the interesting thing about this is that basically he puts out in his book exactly what he thinks, and a lot of people read it, and a lot of people say, ah, he doesn't really mean this. He's not serious about all this. You know, he's just, you know, this is just, you know, he's not talking about militarily conquering. He's just talking about economic control. But uh, that's, that's not exactly what he, what he meant. He pretty much, one thing about Hitler is he kind of means what he says, like when he's, for the most part, except for, you know, whenever he gives you his word, because then he never keeps it. So actually, actually his word's pretty much worthless. It's hard to figure out. He's just an opportunity. He's just an opportunist. So, he wants to create Laban's Realm or Elbow Room mostly by conquering a big part of the Soviet Union, the Ukraine, all those areas where a lot of, a lot of the food is produced for the Soviet Union. Because one of the problems in World War I is that Germany couldn't sustain the war effort because they ran out of food at home. Like people are starving at home. It's hard to keep people excited about the war effort when they're starving. So they thought if they conquered the Ukraine and all these other places that produce all this grain, that if when they go to war again, as he believed they would, they'd have plenty of food, and so they could sustain the war effort a lot longer. And so they, they could also use those areas to feed all the uh, Aryan race people, basically. So his rise to power... 
Uh, following his release from prison, Hitler began reforming the NSDAP, or Nazi Party, and trying to consolidate power. Uh, after the stock market crash in 1929, the German economy tanked once again, spurring anger throughout Germany and swelling the ranks of the NSDAP. Uh, I'll just start calling them the Nazi Party. The Nazis began taking greater control of the German Reichstag, or the Parliament. Um, and in 1932, Hitler tried to run for president and was defeated by this guy named Hindenburg. Uh, Hindenburg had actually been the commander of the German forces at the end of World War I, along with Ludendorff. There were Hindenburg and Ludendorff, but uh, Hindenburg was the older one of the guys. Uh, anyway, so they were supposed to set up a coalition government because the Nazis had the majority of seats in the Reichstag. Not a, not a clear majority, not like, you know, over 50%. Because there's a lot of different parties in. Does anybody know anything about the British Parliament? You know how there's like all these different parties. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that in Germany at this point. But the the, the Nazis have the biggest share, I guess you could say. Uh, so Hitler's supposed to form a coalition government with all these other people, but he doesn't want to do that. So it kind of sets off this standoff, and they think there's going to be all this gridlock in in Parliament. So Hindenburg actually offers Hitler the chancellor's job which is like just below the president. And of course, Hitler takes it. And you know, from that point on, Hitler's only going to grow in power. But he never actually wins a legitimate election. Um, he actually loses the only election that he actually you know, runs in, which is when he runs against Hindenburg for president. But it doesn't matter. He's still going to end up in complete control of Germany pretty quickly. Um, uh, Hitler's actually going to consolidate more power after the Reichstag was set on fire by communist agitators in 1933. I will say allegedly set on fire by communist agitators. It's really not necessarily sure, or you know, nobody really knows exactly who said it, whether it was communist agitators. They, there's like this story about this one guy who's going around like setting places on fire. They say he's a communist. But, you know, if you um, if you use the, the old Latin phrase, qui bono, like who actually does this benefit of the uh, burning of the Reichstag, it could have easily just been uh, you know, a Nazi acting like a communist agitator actually because it sets it on fire. Because what's going to happen is after the Reichstag burns, Hitler asks to be granted with um, emergency powers that he could use to try to deal with communist agitators and people who are trying to overthrow the government. And he's granted those emergency powers. And just for a spoiler alert, he's never going to give up those emergency powers. So um, he's going to become... Uh, the de facto uh, dictator pretty quick. So after being granted emergency powers, Hitler took the opportunity to purge, it should say purge and not purse, uh, the Nazi party as well as take care of some political adversaries. So like several hundreds of members of the Nazi party will actually be executed, assassinated, because they tried to speak out against the Nazi party for trying to align themselves with military leaders and uh, business owners, which socialists don't like those things. Um, so they take all the socialist sympathizers out and they execute them. Um, and so while uh, this is this is known as the Night of the Long Knives, it happens in 1933. Um, so while people internationally were shocked by the incident, many in Germany believed he was just restoring order. Uh, they didn't think anything was wrong with it, necessarily. So you kill a couple hundred people, hey, you know, He's just, he's just trying to keep order, guys. So it's not a big deal. Leave him alone. So in 1934, President Hindenburg died, as old people do. He was like 85 or something like that. He's pretty old. Um, and Hitler decided to uh, merge the office of Chancellor and the President together. You know, just as, as one does. Uh, why do we need another President when we could just merge it, the Chancellor's job with the President's job? And I'll just do both things. He actually will hold an election in 1936, but by that point, like I think he wins like 90-some percent of the vote, you know, one of those classic dictator elections. Um, <clears throat> so later on that year, Hitler had the entire Reichswehr, or the, the German military, swear an oath of allegiance to him specifically and removed any officers who descended. So if you weren't willing to, sign, to agree to the uh, oath of allegiance to Hitler, then... You, you, know, you had to go home. Uh, by 1935, Hitler was officially the dictator of Germany. So, you know, in three years, he goes from losing the election for president to being the supreme leader 
of uh, Germany with completely unchecked power. Looked like he knew what he was doing. Well, he was he was pretty savvy in terms of uh, getting people uh, on it, or you know, I guess taking control, organizing. So with the many problems with the economy when Hitler took over, he immediately took action. Uh, Hitler broke up all workers' unions throughout Germany and gained favor of very wealthy business owners. Uh, he then began priming the economy through military spending projects, putting people back to work and building military infrastructure. This made him very popular among many Germans. Uh, his first actions uh, uh, then took first actions against the Treaty of Versailles. So at this point, he consolidates support in Germany, and then he starts actually striking out against the Treaty of Versailles. The first thing he does is he triples the German military from 100,000 to 300,000 uh, and supplements the army with a paramilitary police force, which would eventually become the Nazi SS part, or group. Um, so although the technical size of the military is only 300,000, they also had this huge police force, which was basically military. And they would do the same thing with the, the uh, air force. They would you know, have like civilian pilots. They weren't supposed to have any air force at all. So they, they had like uh, military pilots who were uh, flying what were supposedly civilian planes until he had built up like 2,000 planes and he just unleashed them like, oh, I actually have this air force and you can't do anything about it because it's the strongest air force in the world. Just like all of a sudden. He's just kind of doing a little loophole and also explicitly breaking the rules. Well, he... Uh, Hitler knew that a lot of people uh, in Europe were not really, they didn't really want to go to war um, again because of World War One. A lot of people had a lot of fatigue because of World War One, and so he just kind of was like pressing a little button. He's like, I know you're not really going to fight me over this, and then this, and then this, and then this. Um, <clears throat> he just kept redrawing the line that he could cross. So, uh, almost immediately, Hitler began separating Jews from the rest of society. In 1935, he imposed the Nuremberg Laws, which stripped Jews of German citizenship and basic rights. So, uh, almost as soon as he takes uh, power. Um, although he was building, rebuilding German infrastructure, he was also immediately setting out, uh, setting aside Jewish people like they were, they were not actually citizens um, or people in general. Uh, in 1938, 12,000 Polish Jews were forced to leave in the middle of the night, taking only one suitcase with them, and deported back to Poland, where they were refused entry. So for weeks, they were forced to live on the border without shelter, money, or food, um, which is a, basically a humanitarian disaster. There will actually be a large group of, of German uh, Jewish immigrants that try to flee to the United States during this time, but the U.S. had, something, had imposed something called uh, immigration quotas, so they didn't actually allow them to enter the country. Um, it was like, I can't remember, they were all aboard the steamship. I think it was like three to 4,000 uh, German Jews that actually got deported back to Germany and then would, most of them would eventually end up dying during the Holocaust. Uh, on November 10th, 1938, a night known as, as the Night of Broken Glass, uh, violence broke out against Jews throughout Germany. Over 700 or, or over 7,500 businesses were looted or destroyed. 30,000 Jews were taken to concentration camps, and millions of dollars worth of goods were stolen from Jews. Uh, and that's really kind of the, the official beginning of the Holocaust. There will be uh, a lot more violence against Jews that starts coming about as a result um, of the Night of Broken Glass. So, shifting gears away from Germany for a little bit, we'll go to Stalin and the Soviet Union. So, following the death of Lenin in 1923, Joseph Stalin began consolidating power until he had achieved complete power over the Communist Party in 1927. Uh, through many purges, assassinations, and exiles, Stalin gained absolute authority. Um, again, kind of like Hitler, a uh, very good political operative in terms of especially turning people against each other. Um, you know, his, the people that he came up with, he would have them killed or assassinated if they turned against him. Leon Trotsky, who had been one of the triumvirate, you know, one of the three leaders of the uh, you know, Bolshevik Revolution along with Lenin, 
He has him exiled out to Mexico before he has an assassin actually track him down in Mexico and kill him with an ice pick, um, which is kind of wild when you think about it. Um, but he was absolute master at, at, at just those kind of political games. Um, he also immediately began planning to rapidly industrialize the Soviet Union, bringing it into closer competition with its European neighbors. Uh, Stalin forced the collectivization of all four farms across, it should say, the Soviet Union, not Europe. Uh, not Europe. He didn't have control over all of Europe, uh, just part of it. Um, in order to feed the workers and sell the grain to European countries for cash. So basically, he forced private uh, landowners to um, basically give their farms to the state for the state to use and sell their produce however they seem, uh, however they wanted to, uh, because Stalin really needed the money from selling the grain to Europe in order to pay for his industrial projects. Um, and these plans were these projects were called uh, five-year plans, which he used to rapidly industrialize Russia. Russia had been very far behind the rest of the world at that point. Um, when it came to industry, so they wanted to rapidly industrialize them to try to compete with everybody else. But it ends up backfiring and it actually leads to one of the worst famines in the history of the world. Um, actually, one of the worst atrocities in, in the world. We talked about the Holocaust, six million people died during the Holocaust, and it was awful uh, in a lot of ways. But the Holodomor was probably just as bad in a lot of ways. Uh, it was actually a man made famine. It started in the Ukraine in 1932. Um, basically, um, Stalin was forcing the requisition of all this grain so that he could sell it overseas, or not really overseas, but to the rest of Europe for money. Uh, well, this this uh, famine breaks out, and like people are starving to death, and Stalin knows that they're starving to death. But rather than diverting any grain to help them, you know, make bread or you know, give them some food, he just continues selling it and doesn't really pay any attention to what's going on in uh, the Ukraine or even helping them at all. And ultimately, about 10 million people are going to die as a result. Um, I mean, it's some really brutal stuff, and it's called the Holodomor. And we don't hear about it very much these days in America, but it was just as bad as anything that happened um, anywhere else. Uh, and it was supposedly during this event that Hitler, or the... Uh, Stalin's most famous saying that, you know, one death is a tragedy and uh, a million deaths is a statistic. This is supposedly when he said that, although it's not even clear if he actually ever really said that at all anyway. But so that was a, a really bad thing that happened uh, in the, the Stalin regime while he was trying to basically, you know, just get enough money to continue industrializing felt like sacrificing 10 million people was worth it. So anyway, um, the next thing that we see happening happens in 1936 um, during something called the Spanish Civil War. So uh, in 1936, years of political unrest boiled over into civil war in Spain. Uh, and this be quickly becomes a proxy war, which if you don't know what proxy war means, it's basically like a war between two nations that aren't actually fighting there. So although the, the Civil War is happening in Spain, it's actually a proxy war for Germany and Italy against the Soviet Union. Because on one side you have the nationalists who are supported by Hitler and Mussolini, and then you have the Republicans, or they're called the Republicans, who are being supported um, by Joseph Stalin. Um, and they're both funneling money and weapons in there and basically seeing how effective their weapons are basically on the civilians of Spain uh, because they're going to be the ones that have to bear the brunt of the war that gets fought. Um, like I said, it becomes an opportunity for Hitler to experiment with his new air force, uh, the Luftwaffe. Uh, and it was used to devastating effect. Um, over here on the right, you see this painting. Everybody heard of Pablo Picasso? Um, that's his painting of Guernica. Uh, which was a city in Spain that was actually bombed by the German Luftwaffe during the Spanish Civil War. And something like 10,000 uh, Spanish civilians died as a result. Um, and that's what that painting is supposed to be a painting of. Uh, of course, he uses that real abstract form of art, so um, it's interesting. Um, eventually, after three long years of war, Franco and the Nationalists are going to come out on top. Uh, but in some ways, Spain still hasn't even recovered from the, it was very brutal, um, the Civil War was, and they won't be ready to fight 
you know, with Hitler and Mussolini when World War II breaks out, and they'll actually both basically be neutral and basically taken over by the British and Americans. Um, at various points, who kind of used Spain as a jump-off point to invade North Africa later. So while that's going on, uh, Italy invades Ethiopia. So in 1935, Mussolini sets his sights on finally taking over Ethiopia. You may remember that Abyssinia, Ethiopia, was the one nation in Africa that hadn't fallen to European control during the age of imperialism. Uh, well, uh, Mussolini decides that he's going to fix that in 1935 and invades uh, and finds out that it's a lot easier when you have tanks and you have uh, planes, or they, whereas they didn't have in, in 1896. So it actually goes pretty easily for them. Uh, they're able to conquer uh, Ethiopia by 1936 pretty easily. They're actually, then they're going to turn around and invade Albania, which is just a small area um, in the Balkans region of Europe. So that sets up uh, a period of time called the, uh, or, well, not really called the Age of Appeasement, but basically Hitler and appeasement. So we talked about him pushing the boundary. So he's got complete control of Germany now, so now he's going to start using it uh, on the, on the uh, world stage a little bit. Uh, so um, with power in Germany consolidated, Hitler begins to push the envelope in expanding German borders. Uh, he starts by winning a plebiscite. And what a plebiscite is, is it's basically just like a vote that a, an area takes to determine you know, where they stand on some issue. Um, and the, in the Treaty of Versailles, a lot of Germany had been broken up into smaller areas, and they had these votes to decide if they wanted to be a part of Germany, or if they wanted to be their own independent nation, or if they wanted to join some other country. And the Saar Valley had a lot of Germans in it. Um, it really wasn't even that big of an area, but they voted in 1935 to join, rejoin the German Empire. Um, wasn't that big of a, a shock when it happened. Um, Having already broke the Treaty of Versailles in regards to the size of the military, Hitler went one step forward in 1936 by remilitarizing the Rhineland, which was forbidden according to the Treaty of Versailles. So basically that just meant the Rhineland was the area that bordered uh, France. It was part of Germany. Uh, it just went along the, the river of the Rhine. Uh, and he finally re he moved the army back into the Rhineland. They weren't allowed, they weren't supposed to be there. Um, but again, he moves them in there, and again, the international community doesn't do anything. The League of Nations don't do anything about it. Uh, Britain and France both balked at the move and did nothing, believing that enough time had passed that it was now okay. It was now all right for you to go ahead and move your troops back to the Rhineland. It was German territory anyway, so, you know, who cares? Big deal. So then this event happens called the Anschluss. Uh, and if anybody has ever seen... Um, the sound of music, that's kind of what the Angelus is about. Um, it refers to the political union between Germany and Austria. So in 1938, the Austrian Nazis had attempted to gain political power in Austria, but were mostly unsuccessful. Uh, the Nazis appealed to Hitler for help, and Hitler appealed to the Chancellor to join Germany. He basically just comes out and says, hey, join with us. Yeah, I know you're your own independent nation, but everybody there speaks German. We're all you know, Germanic peoples, you should just, you know, drop having your own country. That's no fun. Join Germany. We're a lot more fun. Uh, and the chancellor says, no, he's not going to do that. So Hitler kind of gets a little more forceful and says, well, you're mistreating all of these Austrian uh, Nazis, and you should just have this referendum to decide, let the people in, in Austria decide for themselves. And the chancellor says, okay, let's do that. Let's go ahead and have a vote. So on the day that the the day before the vote is supposed to happen, the Austrians are supposed to vote on whether or not they want to join Germany or not. Uh, Hitler decides it's not going to take any chances. It basically has the SS cross the border into Austria. The Austrian Nazis who are there decide to line the streets and cheer them on as they basically, you know, the entire military comes over the border and forces the Austrian government to, um, you know, to join Germany whether they like it or not, and they take over Austria without even having to fire a shot. Um, so the day they're supposed to have the, the vote, they just, they, they just cross the border with the military. And that is called the Anschluss. So the, the joining of Austria and Germany is called the Anschluss. Or Anschluss, or however you say that on that. So, 
just to think if he thought that Hitler was done there. He's definitely not. So next he turns his attention to this area of Czechoslovakia known as the Sudetenland. The Sudetenland is basically all this area in gray. This is this all is Czechoslovakia. Uh, and this area is called the Sudetenland. It's basically an area of Czechoslovakia that was inhabited by a lot of Germans, ethnic Germans. Uh, but you'll notice that it's all on the perimeter of Czechoslovakia. So this is like the border. So generally countries put all their defenses around their border because that's where you would get attacked from. Right? I mean, you can't attack here until you come through here. So um, there's a lot of, of Czech, Czech military installations there. Um, and basically Hitler just goes to the international community and says, I want to take this date land. There's a lot of Germans there. They're ethnic Germans. They're being mistreated by the, the Slavs who are in control in Czechoslovakia. Um, and on the surface, it sounds ridiculous. Like who would just grant Germany the right to take all this territory? Well, uh, England would. So. Neville Chamberlain and um, other leaders, uh, Benito Mussolini and the leader of France, fly to Munich to meet with Hitler, and they basically sign what's called the Munich Agreement that grants Hitler all this territory, as long as he agrees that he doesn't have any more aspirations. He's not going to take over any more territory. He's going to call it quits right here. And Hitler says, okay, I'll do that. I'm not after any more territory once I take this today and land. We'll just end it right here. So they give him control of the Sudetenland, which basically devastates Czechoslovakia. They lose all their military installations, areas they'd spent you know, years building up so that they could prevent a German invasion, just gets given away you know, at the snap of a finger by people who aren't even Slovaks. There's nobody in Czechoslovakia who's actually at this meeting to agree to allow Germany to do this. Um, it's just gone. And so then, as you might imagine, uh, a couple months later, Germany just annexes the rest of Czechoslovakia. And still, the international community does nothing. Uh, Neville Chamberlain comes home, he flies home, he's got this piece of paper that Hitler signs, he holds it up, he says it's peace in our time. That Hitler has decided that, that you know, we've got him to agree to this deal, there's not going to be any, any more war, everything's fine and taken care of, which is like one of the most famous world wonders in the history of the world, because... Well, obviously, we know how the story is going to go. So if that wasn't enough to cause a lot of outrage, which there's plenty of reasons for outrage here, uh, in 1939, it gets released that Germany and the Soviet Union have signed this non-aggression pact, which, if you know anything about Hitler, and if you know anything about Stalin, the fact that they would agree to sign a non-aggression pact with each other is insane. Um, these two are considered moral enemies. I mean, Hitler wrote a book called Mein Kampf that said that the Germans needed to invade the Soviet Union and conquer most of the, of the Soviet Union, take it from the Soviet Union. Um, you know, the, the Socialist Party, the, the, or the Bolshevik Communists are completely against any kind of form of nationalism, um, you know, in terms of what Germany is trying to do. I mean, these two are mortal enemies, and they signed this agreement that they are not going to attack each other. Um, they'd actually been working for years secretly, uh, trying to expand their militaries and working on new military technology. They've been, they've been watching each other do maneuvers uh, in the field for some time. Uh, and so in 1939, they, they released this agreement. But the big thing, the big part of the agreement that was secret that nobody knew at the time was that um, they agreed that they would divide Poland up between each other. So Poland was, an, it was a new nation that it hadn't been on the map for a while. It actually wasn't a new nation. It was a very old nation, but it had just been put back on the map after World War I. And Germany and the Soviet Union agreed that they would both invade Poland at the same time and split it in half. Um, which was you know, not very fair to the Polish people, and they're going to get really the brunt of some really bad atrocities that are going to happen. Uh, throughout World War II. Really not a great time to be a Pole. Really there's not really any good times in recent history. Going all the way back to like the 1600s. It's rough being a Polish civilian. So, um, Great Britain and France finally draw the line at Poland. And they tell Germany beforehand, that if you invade Poland, 
we're going to war. This is finally, this is the line, this is it. This is the straw that will break the camel's back. Don't do it. And Hitler, who's obviously been trained that he can do whatever he wants, decides that he's going to go ahead and invade Poland on September 1st, 1939. And that brings the British and the French in to declare war on Germany. And now Europe's at war. The irony is that the Soviet Union also invades Poland and the British and French do not declare war on the Soviet Union, just Germany, even though the Soviet Union is also invading Poland. And, it, and that makes sense, I guess. So. They don't like Germans. So it's just against, it's just against Germany and Hitler. Um, this actually sets up what's called the Phony War, because um, for eight months, France and Great Britain actually don't even invade Germany. Germany is actually actively fighting the Poles, and the French and, and British, it would have been probably a good time to invade Germany. They probably could have done it pretty quickly, but they decided they're not going to do it. And so until May 1940, there's actually no fighting that happens on the Western Front. So it's kind of different than World War I, where, you know, after war gets declared, that first month is like the bloodiest month of the entire war. Um, in this case, there's not any fighting until May of 1940 when the Germans are going to invade France and basically knock out France in about two months. Uh, it's not going to take them very long, as opposed to World War One, where you know it took them four years and they still didn't, weren't able to do it. Uh, the Soviet Union also invades Estonia, Finland, and Lithuania, and actually they'll they'll have a really tough time invading Finland, um, fighting the Finns um, initially, and it really looks bad for the Soviets at first. But their, but their army looks really weak and disorganized. Um, they have these huge numbers, but they're dying in huge numbers too. Uh, but eventually, throughout the war, they're going to continuously build up, and by the end of the war, they're probably going to have one of the well, they're going to have one of the top two strongest militaries in the world by the end of the war. Anyway, so three causes of uh, World War II in Europe. Uh, first is the rise of nationalism as a result of harsh terms from the Treaty of Versailles, and a lot of the issues that we see that cause World War II all stem from the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, political extremism as a result of economic hardships from the Treaty of Versailles. Um, anytime that you have like a Great Depression or some kind of uh, really terrible event that's going on, it generally lends itself to extremism, with extremists, because people want change, they want something to, to help them, and so they're, they're more prone to, to decide to side with somebody like the Nazis who are actively, it seems like, actively making their lives better in some ways. Uh, and also political appeasement from the League of Nations in an effort to prevent war. So um, at the active acts of appeasement that Great Britain and France and other nations um, agree to in order to prevent an outbreak of war probably actually play a bigger role in starting a war than actually creating any kind of peace. So any questions about uh, the interwar period in Europe? And this is an oversimplification. There's actually a ton of things that happen, uh, but we just don't have time to cover all of it. That's all the highlights. <clears throat> so tomorrow we'll talk about the interwar period in Asia, which should basically just be called the war period because it's pretty much fighting in Asia the entire time. Um, and we'll see kind of why a lot of historians almost refer to, instead of having a World War One and World War Two, it's all just a part of the same conflict. Because the Japanese and the Chinese are going to be fighting from 1931 just about on. It's only 12 years from the end of from 1919, right? Mm -hmm. All right, let's go get some lunch. Thank you. Can you explain why they didn't play this smart?